Proverbs. Yeah, I love the book of Proverbs. I hope you're enjoying this book along with me because it's just so so these Proverbs are so short and so right to the point and so practical. And what a wonderful book God has given us here. In Proverbs chapter 20, verse 7, it says this. It says, A blameless man who walks in his integrity, blessed are his sons after him. A blameless man, God talks about. You know, the best that anybody can be before God is blameless. None of us can possibly hope to be perfect or sinless. The best that we can possibly be is blameless. If God doesn't blame you for your sins because Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior and He has paid for those sins and He has washed those sins away, then you're in great shape because you are blameless before God. He doesn't hold you accountable for your sins if you are a Christian. So it says, A blameless man who walks in integrity, blessed are his sons after him. And again, it doesn't mean sinless. A blameless person here refers to somebody who is honest, somebody who is a person of integrity. And God says the children of somebody like that have a great benefit from their life and from their example. Verse 8. A king who sits on the throne of judgment winnows all evil with his eyes. Well, certainly a good king will do that. A good ruler in any area of life will winnow all evil out of his land or out of the area that he rules over. And when Jesus returns and sits on his throne, that's exactly what he is going to do. He's going to see through all the phoniness. He's going to examine all the evidence. And Jesus will make decisions based on truth and justice, not on appearance or not on anything else except that. Verse 9. And here's the reason why that's so important. It says, Who can say, I have made my heart clean? I am pure from my sin. The reason that a good leader must be careful to examine issues and very carefully and base his decisions on truth and justice is because not everybody does what is honest and not everybody does what is right. And so God has given civil government the job of distinguishing between right and wrong and separating the good from the evil. Look at 9 again. Who can say, I have made my heart clean? I am pure from my sin. And I suppose anybody can say it, right? Anybody can say, I'm sinless, I'm pure. But anybody who says, I am pure and I am without sin, they are either self-deceived or they are lying. And they have certainly lowered God's standards and redefined sin. That is for sure as far as God is concerned, because God says all have sinned and all of us have fallen short of His glory. We all equally, we all need the Savior. I don't care if you've gone to church all your life. I don't care if you've gone to synagogue all your life. Or I don't care if you've been a drunken bum laying in a ditch, you know, drinking wine out of your brown paper bag. It doesn't matter. We're all in the same boat. We all need a Savior. Every last one of us. Ten. Diverse weights and diverse measures are both alike an abomination to the Lord. And this is talking about dishonesty. Dishonesty in any form is an abomination to Almighty God. If there is anyone, anywhere, who does anything dishonest in order to benefit themselves at the expense of someone else, That is something that God detests. Verse 11. Even a child makes himself known by his acts, whether what he does is pure and right. Now, I've talked to people who've, who've had several children, and they knew almost from the time that their children were born what kind of personality their child was going to have. And they knew that one child would be different from another 
almost from the time that they were born. And it is. It's pretty easy to see the basic nature of a person even very early on in their life. Some behavior is learned. There's no question about that. But each person comes equipped with their own unique personality. And it's pretty easy to see it, even at an early age. And that's what God is saying here. Twelve. The, I love this verse. The hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord has made them both. I wish I was more of an expert on the human body. At least I wish that whenever I read a verse that deals with the human body because I knew I know that if I would know more about the human body I would appreciate God even more than what I do it, like this verse here the incredible design the little that I know about the ear it just amazes me the incredible design of the human ear that hears or the incredible detailed design of the human eye that sees that is no accident of evolution people who believe that are just unbelievably gullible an accident of evolution you got to be kidding me think man that is impossible it's impossible there is no way in this world the design of the human eye that can see or the human ear that can hear is so detailed and so exact and so complicated and so and so precise that no one but a super intelligent, wise creator God could draw up the blueprint and then build it while he's forming you inside of your mother's womb. Amazing. And so God says hearing and seeing, that's a gift from God. Your ability to hear and your ability to see is a gift from God. Therefore, it should be used in a way that is glorifying to God. Verse 13. Love not sleep, lest you come to poverty. Open your eyes, and you will have plenty of bread. Staying out of the poorhouse really is no mystery. Um, especially in, in a country like the United States of America. It's no mystery. You work even when you don't feel like working. You get out of bed even when you feel so good you keep laying in that bed you get out of bed and you work and you work when you don't feel like work and you stay out of working and you'll stay out of the poorhouse verse 14 look at this it is bad it is bad says the buyer but when he goes away then he boasts isn't that the way it is now I'm not much of a wheeler dealer type of a person I'm no good at that kind of thing but I certainly know how it goes and so do you and so do God so does God you go down to the car dealership and you tell the car salesman you look at a car you know and you say well this piece of junk thing's not worth half of what you're asking for look at a dent in the door here look at this dent look at these scratches on the back you know, look at the rust spots over here here's another one over here look at that engine this thing's got over 100,000 miles on it what kind of junk are you selling here? And so the dealer, you know, he, he brings the price way down. And, and then you buy it. And, and you first thing you do, man, you go home and you call all your friends. And you brag about what, the, what a great deal you got on this beautiful machine that you, you paid so little for. That's how it goes. God recognizes that. Verse 15. It says, There, there is gold... An abundance of costly stones, but the lips of knowledge are a precious jewel. God says there's gold out there, and there's precious jewels. And, and you know, those things are worth a lot. Gold and jewels, they are worth an awful lot. Because they're rare. But God says, people who speak with wisdom, that's even more rare. And so in other words, what God is saying is more people have gold or jewels in one form or another than have wisdom and speak wisely. Some of the wisest people I know have more, have more wisdom than they do gold, though. Some of the wisest people I've known in the past had no gold at all. 
no jewels at all. They were just simple, down-to-earth, God-fearing people who had been reading the Word of God for a long time and spoke with a lot of wisdom. But overall, there's a lot more jewelry in the world than there is wisdom. 16. Take a man's garment when he has given surety for a stranger and hold him in pledge when he gives surety for foreigners. In other words, God is concerned about your financial dealings. He doesn't want you to make stupid mistakes that will cost you money. And what he is saying here is this. If you're going to have a, if you're going to have a, and make a business deal with somebody who is financially reckless, well, God says, make sure you take steps to protect yourself. Watch out. Make sure you protect yourself if you're going to go into a business deal of some sort with somebody who has a track record of being financially reckless. And like this verse is talking about, anybody who's crazy enough to make financial guarantees to somebody who, who he knows has a bad credit risk or has been a bad credit risk, anybody who would make financial guarantees to somebody who he knows is a bad credit risk, that man is a bad credit risk himself. And you've got to be very careful being involved with somebody who is so foolish when it comes to money matters. And so if you have any kind of financial dealings with a person who is that goofy when it comes to financial things, make sure that you protect yourself. Make sure that he has plenty of collateral so you don't lose everything that you have worked for if you make a deal with him. Verse 17. Bread gained by deceit is sweet to a man. And it's a real testimony to the depravity of man that he'd get such a kick out of doing something sneaky and underhanded and dishonest. Pulling a fast one, God says, gives a depraved person a sense of satisfaction. Bread gained by deceit is sweet to a man. But afterwards his mouth will be full of gravel. Yeah, there's a sense of satisfaction to a depraved sinner when he gets something in an underhanded, sneaky way. But God says he's going to be sorry in the long run. It's like taking a big bite of your favorite food. And oh man, it tastes wonderful. What's your favorite food? Think about it. Big bite of your favorite food. Oh boy, it tastes so good in your mouth. But then all of a sudden you feel this piercing pain. And you're thinking, where in the world did this come? I've got a mouthful of delicious food, my favorite food. And all of a sudden i got this piercing pain. And then you look and somehow a piece of aluminum foil was stuck to your food. And boy, when that foil hit your filling, the pain exploded like a rocket in your brain. And God says, likewise, the enjoyment from dishonest gain, it's there but it's very short-lived. And it's followed by sorrow and pain. Verse 18, plans are established by counsel. By wise guidance, wage war. There are certain things that we need the counsel of others on. We always need the counsel of God's word. But we, always, we, should, we should find and, and get the counsel of experts also. People who know, people who have experience. And when a leader is so arrogant and so puffed up with sinful pride that he won't even listen to his generals, chances are that country is going to lose their war. I think Hitler did that. I think I remember hearing or reading about Adolf Hitler where you know, things are going pretty well in the war. And all of a sudden, he wanted, to, he wanted to really turn against Russia, and his generals were warning against him doing it, I think, at that particular time of the year. And Hitler, where he just was so arrogant, so puffed up with pride, he thought, no, I'm not going to listen to you generals. I know better. And he went, and he did it, and it cost him the war, which was a good thing for all of us, but it serves to illustrate that a smart leader will listen to those advisors around him who are experienced and you know, have some expertise. And it goes not just for generals and for leaders and for nations, but it goes for anything. I knew a family one time who, uh, actually I knew them for several years, who they would be that way toward doctors. It was amazing. Over a period of years, many of their family members ended up in the hospital for one reason or another, and they were always quick to criticize the doctors 
criticize the doctors and the nurses and the specialists and try to tell them how to do their job. And I used to sit back and I think, how arrogant can you be? Will you let them do their job? That's what they're getting paid for. I mean, these guys have gone to school for a long time. They have done this for many years. And you, you're going to come in here and try to tell them how to run their business and how to do their job. Well, a wise person looks to others who have expertise in their area and lets them do their job. But it takes a real fool to think that he's, he's an expert in things that he knows absolutely nothing about. Verse 19. He who goes about gossiping reveals secrets. Therefore, do not associate with one who speaks foolishly. He who goes about gossiping reveals secret. Some people talk too much. Don't hang around with them. God is warning, stay away from them. If somebody talks about others behind their back to you, you can be sure, don't kid yourself, you can be sure that they're talking about you behind your back when they're with others. And you hear it from God right here. Stay away from people like that. You don't need to be around that kind of trouble. you got enough trouble if you're a normal person. You don't need to stir up more for yourself by hanging around somebody who talks too much. 20. If one curses his father or his mother, his lamp will be put out in utter darkness. Under the law of Moses that God gave him on Mount Sinai, Cursing one's parents meant the death penalty. Honor your father and mother is a huge command. A very important command. One of the ten. Death penalty for those who would dishonor their parents by cursing them. Now, I don't know exactly what lamp snuffed out in pitch darkness refers to here in verse 20, but I know it's God's way of saying that child is in big trouble. Smart alecky kids are going to be punished by God if they don't repent. There's no doubt about that. 21. An inheritance gotten hastily in the beginning will in the end not be blessed. And of course it all depends on who's inheriting that money. But if you don't have to work for something, chances are you're not going to guard it quite quite as much. That's not true in every case, but it certainly would be true in the case of someone who is money hungry and somebody who is depraved like The prodigal son, for example, a money-hungry, depraved sinner like the prodigal prodigal son, he gets his inheritance and you know just burns a hole in his pocket. So he has to get out there and squander it all on loose living. It doesn't last long for a person like that. Easy come, easy go. Twenty-two. Do not say, "I will repay evil." Wait for the Lord, and He will help you not our business to get revenge. I don't care if people talk about you. I don't care if people do mean things to you. It's not your business to get revenge. Not if you are a Christian. It is not your business to get revenge. That is God's business. Getting people back is sin because that is what it is. It is revenge. And getting people back is also sin because it's an attempt to usurp the role of God as the one who will punish all evildoers in his own time. And so, God is patient with evildoers. And we must be patient with God until he punishes those evildoers. And we must pray for those people who hurt us that they would repent and confess their sin so that God doesn't have to punish them. Because God doesn't like to punish anyone. 23. Diverse weights are an abomination to the Lord and false scales are not good. Dishonest business practices. I mean, it may be the way of the world, but it's not the way of God, and God owns this world. So false business practices are going to be judged by God, just like any other sin. What are false business practices? Well, lying to the customer. You know, rolling back the odometer. Selling something new, even though it's used, selling something as new, only it is used, or whatever. I mean, you can name a million things. Those things are just as sinful as stealing, drunkenness, idolatry, adultery, fornication, taking God's name in vain. And he's going to deal with the sinner who commits those uh, dishonest business practices. Verse 24. 
A man's steps are ordered by the Lord. How then can a man understand his way? God is sovereign. A man's steps are ordered by the Lord. We can plan and we can do our best to plan things out and follow that plan, but the bottom line is this. Our steps are ordered by God. God is sovereign. And God knows what's best, too. Even if we don't if you don't see it, we don't see it right now. God knows what's best. And that's why we shouldn't try to be masters of our own destiny or try to manipulate things in order to get our own way. Instead, we should look to God for direction because He knows what is best. Look to God for direction. Let Him lead through the Word of God and through prayer and not try to do things in our own way. If we don't, if we don't let God lead us, our life will be one pitiful shot in the dark after another and in the end it's going to be a big mess. 25. It is a snare for a man to say rashly, it is holy, and to reflect only after making his vows. In other words, before, before we devote something to God, before we de- dedicate something to God, or before we make a vow to God, we ought to make absolute sure the best that we possibly can that we intend, we intend to fulfill that vow and we are able to fulfill it and not do these things rashly. And it's not a wise thing to dedicate something to God and then have second thoughts about it or pull back later. It's not wise at all because if God can't trust you to keep your promises to Him, He's not going to trust you with much else either. 26. A wise king winnows the wicked and drives the wheel over them. Now, that sounds pretty harsh, but the wheel here really was an instrument used in threshing wheat. It was used to help separate the good wheat from the bad, from the bad uh, chaff. And so God says a wise king does not tolerate, does not tolerate evil. He separates it. He separates them from the righteous and brings the evil to justice and a good leader on any level it doesn't have to be governmental it can be family it can be on the job you know on the sports team whatever it might be a good leader doesn't treat irresponsible people in the same way that he treats responsible people he separates the two and he deals with them according to uh, according to how their actions deserve 27 uh, I like this verse the spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord, searching all his innermost parts. Do you know that God has a lamp inside of you? And it's your spirit. And the word spirit in this particular um, verse refers to your conscience. The spirit of man here in this verse is your conscience. God puts your conscience in you. It is his lamp. Man's conscience is like a moral floodlight given to us by God and its purpose is to throw light on our thoughts and our motives and our actions and it either approves or disapproves of the things that we think or do and you know one thing about the conscience though it needs to be kept healthy because a conscience can grow sick and dull and no longer do its job of separating good from bad it needs to be kept healthy and that only happens by feeding it the word of God. Verse 28. Loyalty and faithfulness preserve the king. Loyalty and faithfulness preserve the king. And his throne is upheld by righteousness. And so, if a leader is characterized by decency, and a leader is characterized by truth, he is going to have the respect and the support of those that he leads. His position as leader is strengthened, not by being a tyrant, but by being a good person, but by being a decent, God-fearing person who stands for right and opposes wrong. That leader will be strengthened in his position. Verse 29, The glory of young men is their strength, but the beauty of old men is their gray hair. I like that verse. It tells me that everybody has something to offer to Christ. If you're still here, 
breathing and thinking, God has God has some, some use for you in in this world if you're a Christian. Everybody has something to offer Christ. There is a gap for every single Christian to fill in service to Jesus Christ. And so this verse talks about young man being strong for service. And it talks about older men having wisdom that comes from years of walking with the Lord Jesus Christ. But it doesn't matter if you're old or young. There's something that you can do for the Lord Jesus Christ. 30. Blows that wound cleanse away evil. Strokes make clean the innermost parts. In other words, physical punishment has a way of removing moral evil. That may not set right with you, set well with you, but it's the truth. Physical punishment removes moral evil. And that's what God says. And it drives me crazy. You know, when the authorities or the psychologists always want to understand wicked people. They want to understand criminals. I want to understand why this guy went into this school and blew away 50 people. You know, I want to understand what make, made those guys in the airplane crash into the Twin Towers. Let's understand it. No, let's not understand it. Because there is no understanding evil. Let's punish it. Let's punish it severely so that people in the future don't do it. Let's make it, let's make it very painful to do any kind of evil and then other people will learn not to do it that is God's way and so when a man I mean you know this if you've ever gotten a speeding ticket you know what I'm talking about a couple of years ago I got picked up I had a speeding ticket I was going 16 miles an hour over the speed limit and my speedometer didn't work doesn't matter didn't matter to the policeman I suppose it doesn't matter because I was breaking the law I was going 16 miles an hour over the speed limit. It cost me, it was a $240 fine or a $200 fine, something like that. Believe me, when a man is tempted to go 16 miles an hour over the speed limit, he remembers how painful it was to write out that check for $200 the last time, and he doesn't go that fast. He's very careful, much more careful than what he used to be. I am. And if a child is tempted to do wrong, He's going to remember how that spanking stung the last time he did that. And so God says, blows that hurt, cleanse away evil. And anybody who doesn't believe it is foolish. You know, open your eyes. Take a look at reality. Chapter 21, the king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. Now, if you're on a beach right next to the water, you can go down... Right next to that water, you can stick your finger right in the edge of the water and you can make yourself a little trench with your finger and move it around in the sand. And you can, you can make that water go in that trench, make it flow any way you want it to flow, anywhere you want it to flow. That is what God can do to a leader's heart. He can change that leader's heart and he can make it flow anywhere he wants it to flow, do anything he wants it to do. Just like your finger in the sand can move that water around. He can overrule a king's self-will anytime he wants to, anytime it suits his eternal purpose. And of course God can do that with anyone's heart. Saved or unsaved, doesn't matter. Saved or unsaved, he can do it with your husband, he can do it with your wife, he can do it with your son, your daughter, your neighbor, your customer, your boss, your co-workers. Pray to God. If you see some changes that need to come, a pa- come to pass, pray to God. He can change people's hearts. Verse 2. Every way of man of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the heart. The Lord weighs, his, weighs the heart of man. He, he understands what's going on deep down inside of our soul. He understands motives. He understands things that are beneath the surface of each one of us. Which is why man is not qualified to decide which Christian is going to be rewarded most by Christ at the judgment seat of Christ. You know that if you're a Christian, you will be rewarded for everything that you do for Christ after you get saved. There will be eternal rewards for you. You and I are not qualified to decide which Christian is going to get the most rewards. We we just can't. It's because 
man judges by outward appearance. But God judges what's in a person's heart. It takes more effort and more determination and more prayer for some people to do a little than it does for others to do a lot. And God takes that all into consideration. That's why we can't be the judge of Christians as to who's going to be rewarded the most or who is the greatest Christian. You've got some guy out there who seems to be doing tremendous things for the Lord. You know, he's a great, a great singer or a great speaker or you know, he gives a ton of money or whatever it might be. He's out there, you know, doing these fabulous things for God. Well, that's wonderful. That's great. And you have some other person who, who struggles to teach a Sunday school class or, or who struggles to put a few bucks in the offering because they're so poor. Well, God knows how much prayer it takes or how much determination it takes or how much strength it takes for you to do even a little. And he doesn't, he doesn't necessarily judge by results. He judges by effort. Verse 3. To do righteousness and justice is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. And it's more important to God that we be good people who treat others as we would like to be treated than for us to be religious. He would much rather have you be a kind, good-hearted person who in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ treats others as you would want to be treated. He'd much rather have you be that way than somebody who goes to church three times a week. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday. And Thursday, he goes knocks on doors on Saturday. Character means much more to God than religious ritual or religion of any kind. I certainly don't want to be known as a religious person. I don't think I am known that way. It surprises me when people you know, suggest that I'm religious. It's much better to be thought of as somebody who really loves Christ and does what is right in his eyes. Verse 4, Haughty eyes and a proud heart, the lamp of the wicked are sin. Pride and arrogance are two things that characterize a wicked person, and both of those things are sinful, pride, and arrogance. There is nothing, nothing cool, for example, about a sports hero who brags. He talks about how great he is. All he is doing is flaunting his sin, it's nothing to be admired, nothing to be looked up to, or and the, and the guy's not worthy of any respect. You know, there are some athletes out there who know Christ and have such a great, humble spirit about them. Now, they don't put themselves down, but they don't go around bragging either. They let their actions speak for themselves, and they let it.